Welcome, students. So we're going to be going over the Renaissance uh, at least study for the AP uh, Euro exam and going over review. So one of the main things that we're going to need to identify, at least with the Renaissance, is how does this Renaissance start? And then go into uh, more of the other aspects you know, of the Renaissance in itself and in specifics. Now remember when you are studying for or the AP test or final, whatever, uh, the, which one that you are doing, what you need to remember again and something that I've always preached is study the main ideas and don't get so hung up on the smaller details. Obviously, you're going to need to know, you know, some more specific things when it comes to the writing aspects of it, but these main ideas are really what you need uh, to focus when it comes to uh, the taking of the actual TEF. Uh, so, the word renaissance, if you remember from the beginning of the year, probably when we did this in September, when you did it in September, we're talking about a rebirth, a rebirth of ancient Greek and Roman ideas. All right, so these ideas that are being brought back into European society, specifically starting in the Italian peninsula and then working its way up into, you know, the northern part of uh, Europe, England, um, you know, the German states, Holland, and those areas eventually as uh, we move on with uh, the Renaissance. And where does this come from? Well, these ideas that are being spread, you know, a lot of it starts in these Italian city-states. And a lot of reason why it's starting in these Italian city-states is because this is where a lot of the merchants and traders are coming in from the Middle East uh, into um, these Italian states. And then you have your bankers, you know, for example, probably the largest family of these patrons of uh, the Italian Renaissance, the Medici family, you know, Cosimo di Medici and his grandson, Lorenzo di Medici, probably the ones that, you know, we kind of know about. We're not talking about Catherine di Medici just yet, you know, her French St. Bartholomew's Day massacre and everything. That's, you know, definitely going to be in a later video. But um, these bankers, these patrons are giving money to, um, you know, artists, to kind of revamp the new ideas of this, you know, rebirthing of a renaissance. Um, and then when you, you get through, you know, some of the artists and everything, obviously, you know, do you need to know every single artist of the renaissance era? No. Do you need to know kind of what each piece of artwork is? No. But do you have to understand the idea that this artwork is going to be humanism? Sure. Okay, and when we're talking about humanism, we're talking about glorifying the human body. And probably one of the best pieces to use as an example is Michelangelo's Statue of David, where you're looking at David and he's got the chiseled muscles. A uh, guy looks like he's lifting. He's completely naked, glorifying, you know, everything. You're not leaving much to the imagination, let's put it that way. But you're seeing how it's almost like he's a complete major athlete that could probably go to the Olympics and, you know, win a gold medal the way that he's kind of built with all of his muscles and, you know, strong uh, aspects of, of his body. So keeping that in mind, this idea of humanism is just like I said, glorifying the human body is becoming a lot more secular. Now, don't get me wrong, are there going to be pieces that are going to be kind of promoting these ideas of, um, you know, the Renaissance and religious things? Yes, of course, because Michelangelo paints the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Raphael does a few pieces dealing with, um, you know, Madonna, which is the Virgin Mary. So you are going to have religious aspects as well. Now, how they kind of all connect and how this idea of, you know, ethics and other things come about. The Renaissance is also starting to open up learning. And by learning, you need to understand, like Casclione, when he was talking about, you know, manners and how to act in public. And then you have Machiavelli, who's writing a political guidebook 
for how to rule, um, you know, for rulers. And you have other literature pieces also coming out with Dante's Inferno, okay? Things are also, these writings are becoming more um, vernacular, meaning in their native language, that people are starting to understand, and this is how this movement really spreads very quickly. Probably one of the most major inventions or most important inventions of this time is going to be Johann Gutenberg's printing press uh, in the 1400s. Uh, the first book that's going to be in this printing press is going to be the, the Bible, but this is how ideas will start to spread more quickly. And because these ideas spread more quickly, this is where when we get to the scientific revolution aspect of everything here, the scientific revolution uh, is going to be um, influenced by this printing press in which then the church starts to fear the spread of these new scientific ideas throughout um, all of Europe, which is why they're going to be focusing on such people like Galileo eventually um, for aspects of um, heresy. So keeping going at least back with the Renaissance, like I said, we had Cassione, we had Machiavelli, and Machiavelli is writing for that Medici family. Um, the idea of uh, how to become uh, better um, as a person. And just to keep in mind, the Italian Renaissance, and really the Renaissance as a whole, is not affecting rural life at all. It's just affecting these urban centers. Okay, So still, most of the population is not going to be too worried about uh, you know what's going on because a lot of like the serfs and whatnot are not going to be able to read anyway. But we're talking about people with money, people that are in these cities that are able then to enjoy and try to have artworks commissioned for them because getting an artwork commission was a sign of power. Um, moving on from the Italian Renaissance, and like I said, do we need to know every single artist? No. Okay, but do we just need to know just the major main ideas behind it? Of course. Uh, so we start to get into something called the Northern Renaissance. And what the Northern Renaissance is, is it's definitely going to be different. A lot of it's going to be more literary. Are you going to get woodcuts um, in, by a drawer, for example? Sure. Are we going to have, you know, eventually Jean van Eck of the uh, Netherlands be doing some things? Absolutely. But when we think of the Northern Renaissance, we think of um, the England, the English Renaissance, this golden age that's going to be during, you know, Henry VIII and Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, William Shakespeare is going to be part of this Northern Renaissance. Uh, Sir Thomas More's Utopia will be part of this Renaissance. And if you uh, remember uh, Sir Thomas More, his Utopian society is supposed to be that everybody is equal. Um, kind of a precursor, or at least an influencer, uh, for someone like uh, Karl Marx, who's eventually going to do the Communist Manifesto. Just to kind of throw that uh, part in here uh, with that. So um, keep that in mind, at least with England. That's what we're talking about, um, you know, at least in that area. Uh, France... Are they going to have a major golden age of the Renaissance? No, because during the 1500s, they're more worried about this idea between Protestantism and uh, Catholicism with, you know, Catherine de' Medici and eventually Henry of Navarre and, you know, all of that wonderful fun that we're going to be getting into when we talk about this Protestant Reformation. But... Um, you will have someone like Montaigne who writes a book of essays, and that's where we get the essay um, format from because of Montaigne. So every single time now that you're writing an essay, at least an AP Euro, you can definitely thank Montaigne and the French for that. Uh, so the Low Countries, like the Netherlands and the German states, this is where... Um, a lot of that uh, is going to be coming into play. Uh, Spain has some other issues uh, they're dealing with, obviously just becoming a brand new country, and then they start focusing on exploration. But you gotta remember, Spain really wasn't a country until the late 1400s. Um, or at least it was a country, but it wasn't you know, completely unified. Uh, you gotta remember there was the Moors, the Muslim Moors that were controlling that area. 
uh, one of the more important pieces to come out of the Spanish Renaissance is going to be Don Quixote. Uh, that's the book where the guy is pretty much fighting windmills thinking that they're dragons. Okay, so not every single uh, aspect, at least every single country, is going to be influenced by the Italian Renaissance. It's mostly going to be first the Italian, and it's going to be that humanistic um, ideas, and then it's going to go into the northern region where it's going to be more um, literary pieces of work. Um, someone else to kind of throw in there is Erasmus. Erasmus with In Praise of Folly, in which he starts to criticize the Catholic Church and the Pope um, for all the things that they were doing. A lot of people kind of connect Erasmus to both not only a Renaissance piece, but kind of a precursor to um, the Protestant Reformation in which that he is questioning what corruption is the Catholic Church happening at this time, you know, when we're talking about different aspects of uh, this corruption. For example, uh, your, um, oh my goodness, the indulgences, just for example. So you are seeing those people as well um, that are getting involved. So main ideas here, okay? Bankers are running everything. Uh, they're going to be the patrons of the arts. You have the Italian Renaissance, a lot more artwork. Um, that's going to be first. It's then going to spread into the northern, and the northern becomes more literary. For the most part, and don't get me wrong, there's definitely going to be books in each one, and there's going to be paintings for each one, but just trying to keep everything on the main ideas. Uh, and then you're going to start to see in the northern Renaissance that they're going to be questioning more things, philosophical things, uh, that are happening, at least at that time, at least the, the big questions um, of that time. Um, another thing to kind of keep in mind, just because we're talking about these Middle Ages, or not so much the Middle Ages, but the Renaissance coming from it, there's still going to be a manor system. This is still going to affect the urban centers, but not so much the farms. Okay, They're still going to have serfs, still going to have nobility, still going to have the manors, still going to have... Um, you know, the feudal system, that's not going to change. All it's doing right now is just opening up a thinking, a way of thinking into this new, um, you know, process, new uh, European thing that's eventually going to affect everything else in Europe because it's going to affect now exploration because of inventions. It's going to affect the scientific revolution. It's going to affect the Protestant Reformation. So that's why, at least in AP Euro, it all starts with the Italian Renaissance, which then eventually becomes the Northern Renaissance, and then affects everything else. Like I said, study the main ideas of pretty much what I just said. You can go into some of the artists to try to see what's going on, but like I said, just keep it simple. So, thank you for um, this first review session of many uh, with the Renaissance. I hope that you learned a lot. I hope that it actually helps bring back a lot of the ideas that we're talking about and keep on studying.